make our way through the Westminster Confession of Faith, we now come to uh, sections 3 and 4 of the 19th chapter. That chapter considers the law of God. And so we'll take a look at sections 3 and 4 and then make a few comments on that. Beside this law, commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age, ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, His graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits, and partly holding forth diverse instructions of moral duties, all which ceremonial laws are now abrogated under the New Testament. To them also, as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws, which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any other now, further than the general equity thereof may require. So God has revealed himself in this moral law. We saw last week that that begins right from the very spark creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they are accountable to God for his moral law, and they need to live in that light. We saw from Romans 5 that throughout the course of history, from the days of Adam through Noah, men uh, died, and eventually the world was judged under Noah. How could death occur if there was no law and no sin? Sin is a violation of law. Well, the presence of death in that ancient world reminds us that there was something to cause that death. Death is not just simply a part of this world order. It is rather the sentence or judgment of God. And so it reflects the fact that mankind from the very start were subject to God's moral law. That moral law came to uh, prominence under the Mosaic Covenant as God revealed himself at Mount Sinai and gave to Moses those uh, two tablets of stone with this law written on there. But that's not all that God had to say for his people. He gave them further instructions as to how they were to live before him. These laws that God gave to his people anticipated their situation in life. Their situation in the wilderness as they wandered about. Then also their situation as they would enter into the land of Canaan and settle in there, forming their own kingdom which was not yet really in place. They had no king. And so God gave to his people a, a set of laws, and our confession divides them up into two categories, civil laws and ceremonial laws. These are applications of the moral law to the situation of the people in that covenant period of time. In part, they are influenced by the fact that they are covenantal in nature and uh, eschatological. They look ahead to what God will yet do for us in Jesus Christ. So part of the landscape of these civil ceremonial laws, part of our view of understanding them is that we must see them in the light of the coming Jesus Christ. And in fact, Jesus is the one who interprets all these laws. He fulfills the whole law of God and all of its facets of many features. In one, one respect, we can say that the moral, that, that the law of God is one. It's an organic unity. We don't find these specific terms as they are set aside for us in Scripture, moral, civil, and ceremonial, to describe God's law. They're not three independent actors at work. It's one law with many different aspects to it. Leading us to Jesus Christ, all aspects of the law leading to Jesus. We consider the two uh, portions of that law, the civil and ceremonial now, that anticipate the work of Christ more directly. Specifically, the ceremonial law represents or reminds us of Christ's priesthood. He is the one who enters into the temple of God for us and makes the offering for sin that was sufficient to atone all of our sins. So the ceremonial law was designed to anticipate the work of Christ, to show God's people in their earthly situation something of what Christ would do. 
So when God gave the temple plan or the tabernacle plan to Moses, he said, uh, follow this plan. And he revealed it from heaven. Moses was not free to develop his own plan or to devise his own worship. He would have to follow strictly the plan that God himself gave to him. That was for a purpose. So that it might show us in different ways, as it were, through refracted light, the Lord Jesus Christ and his work as our mediator, our great high priest who intercedes for us. And so the, the confession develops this idea for us that there are several typical ordinances, partly of worship, prefiguring Christ as graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. So when you look at this ceremonial law and consider all the different things that occur, they tell us something of what Christ would do, something of how Christ would uh, benefit us, uh, how Christ would be far greater than what they experienced there in that time. As Hebrews would remind us, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. A greater sacrifice was required. The priests who served in the temple would uh, have to be replaced as they grew old and died. Jesus is an everlasting priest who never grows old for us. So, ceremonial laws uh, teach us something about Jesus Christ and His work. And so when you read through books of Leviticus, which are a challenge, uh, and other portions of the law, you begin to see, if you pay attention, something of what Christ had to do for us, bearing our sin, being a burnt offering, a sacrifice offering, a peace offering, all these many things, giving us different windows and angles into the perfect work of Jesus Christ for us. There are other aspects of that ceremonial law that occurred uh, in, in the area of moral duties. You might think of the cleanliness laws. That, uh, you, you couldn't touch uh, a dead animal or a dead, dead person. You had to be very careful about anything dead. You had to be very careful about washing your hands for certain things. Uh, there are food laws that you had to observe. All these things show the people of God that they are set apart. They are sacred. They are unique. They are set free from death. They're set apart from death and corruption to be God's holy people. And so these ceremonial laws teach us about our relationship to Jesus Christ and is accomplished for us by making us His holy people. But God's law also is reflected in the body politic, or the, the judicial laws that are given in the Old Covenant period of time. These are ways in which we see something of Jesus' work as our King. He rules and governs over, over us. He punishes sin. He disciplines his people. He leads us in the paths of righteousness. So civil authorities were established in Israel over the course of time. Uh, judges in, in the, the various cities, as well as kings, uh, would rule from Jerusalem. And these various laws were given to guide the people to defend them from evil and corruption and the, the advance of corruption in their culture. So that they might be God's holy people, morally. And so crimes were punished in a variety of capacities. And we can talk about that more at another time. But including the death penalty throughout the old covenant period of time. And so these penalties, these civil laws were applied but they were unique to Israel's situation as a nation before God during this Old Covenant period of time. And with the uh, conclusion of that nation, with the coming of Christ and the fulfillment even of the, of the civil laws in Christ our King, who establishes His kingdom in heaven, who rules over the heavens and the earth as the great King, currently ruling over kings and authorities and all who are in power, Jesus Christ is our civil ruler, ruling over us. And we apply, we learn from those lessons in the Old Testament, all those laws, we apply them to our circumstances today by means of the general equity of those laws. And so it makes sense not only to observe the moral law, but also its applications to various circumstances in life, case laws. What do we do with as we discussed one Thursday morning, what do we do with speed limits? Well, speed limits are set up to preserve life so that we don't have massive traffic accidents. And, and they also produce cult culture and commerce and trade. 
safety, economics, all these things are, are applications of the Ten Commandments to current society. And governing authorities have a certain measure of right to establish laws that govern <coughs> these things. They should be tyrannical or oppressive. They should not impose themselves in areas where they don't belong. <coughs> but there is a right place for civil authorities to exercise their uh, judgment on what will promote the greatest health and peace and well-being for our society. <coughs> so God has given these laws, both ceremonial and civil to guide us in the way that we should live before Christ. In our worship, we worship the Lord with praise and praise and thanksgiving. We approach Christ, our great high priest, who intercedes for us. As a people civilly active, we serve Christ in our world today. We seek to advance his righteousness in every aspect of life and seek to bring him glory in the world.